6 p.m., July 24th, 2012. I was walking from the office, looking forward to a game of squash with a friend. Put my car keys in the ignition, and just then my phone beeped. The president of Ghana, John Atta Mills, was dead. I scanned all my news apps, no official confirmation yet, but Twitter was awash with rumors. Either way, I had to be prepared. What would happen to the country politically? Would there be a smooth transition or economic and political turmoil? I switched my car off and headed back to the office. I had to react to this in real time. From assessing succession politics in Ghana to revolutions in Egypt, election outcomes in Nigeria, and the economic effects of Ebola in West Africa, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the life of a political economist. I often joke and I say my job is like trying to predict the future, which is pretty difficult in the absence of a crystal ball. I travel the length and breadth of Africa, assessing political, economic, security, and operational dynamics, and basically I try to make sense of what's happening in Africa. Truth be told, I love my job. It's edgy, it's dynamic, it's unpredictable. No day is ever the same. I'm constantly wrestling with different thoughts, opinions, debates. It's amazing. I've seen things that have startled me. I've met people with so many different points of view, and I felt things I never thought I'd feel. I've been able to experience Africa through a very unique perspective, one that I don't think many people will have the opportunity of having. I've met with former heads of states, I've been on panels in fancy hotels with central bank governors. I've partied all night in Angolan nightclubs. I've dashed and I've darted and I've dived through Lagos traffic jams to avoid missing flights. I've traveled on rickety aircrafts to Ouagadougou. And I've even been emergency evacuated across the Congo River. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an education that no textbook and no degree will ever teach you. And on this journey, I've been deeply inspired, but also really saddened. I've had my highest highs, and I've had my lowest lows. And it's this either-or dichotomy, which is one of the most confounding aspects of working in and for Africa. You see, either Africa's rising, or it's the hopeless continent. Either it's the continent of poverty, famine, war, disease, and destruction, or it's a thriving frontier for foreign investment that's bursting with potential. Either you're an Afro-optimist, or you're an Afro-pessimist. Either you can do well for yourself, or you can do good for society. And there's seemingly very little room for anything in between. Yet, Africa is not a country. It's a continent of 54 very different countries. You've got different races, tribes, customs, mentalities, ways of doing things. You've got cultures, subcultures, sub-subcultures. It's a vast and unique geographic landscape with different political, economic, and cultural differences. And it's a maze from politics to policies to languages to skills, you name it. And yet, we continue to frame Africa in these either-or terms. And it's a major drawback that constrains our ability to develop the necessary solutions to solve the continent's major problems. Now, I first came to this realization on a country risk trip to Rwanda. Now, Rwanda had been hailed as the Singapore of Africa, a new model for Africa's development. And truth be told, I didn't believe the hype. I was skeptical but Rwanda blew my mind. I landed at the airport through customs immigration with a visa and bag seven minutes flat. I experienced the pristine and immaculately kept streets of Kigali. In the taxi on the way to my hotel, I surfed the net in free 4G Wi-Fi. This was not the Rwanda I was expecting. But beyond the cosmetics and the window dressing, as some of you might think, the country had been making undeniable and real progress 
in development. Everywhere I looked, education, access to healthcare, sanitation, water. I had read all the stats, but now I was seeing it with my own eyes. This was not the Rwanda that I was expecting. And this bore no resemblance to a country that had just experienced one of the most bloody and brutal genocides less than two decades ago. And so, I tried to figure out this Rwanda story, but still something didn't stick, because it didn't fit the model of good governance that I had been taught. You see, there was a right way and a wrong way of governance. And Rwanda was simply too unorthodox and unconventional for me to fully comprehend. Rwanda was a pseudo-democracy. It relied on one key and charismatic leader. Civil liberties were limited. And yet, it was creating jobs, it was reducing inequality, literacy rates had increased exponentially. So if politics of the stomach and inclusive growth were the urgent challenges for Rwanda and Africa, was this really such an issue? And so I left Rwanda scratching my head. Was this Africa rising? Why didn't it tally with my assumptions? And how was I meant to reconcile this dichotomy? I don't think I'm alone in this dilemma. But through my travels, I've had a number of these penny-dropping moments, which have fundamentally shaped and shifted the way I've thought about issues in Africa. Like a trip to Botswana, which showed me that this winner-takes-all type of capitalism that we tend to celebrate is a deeply flawed and outdated model of financial success. See, growing up in finance, you're taught that capitalism is good and socialism is wrong. But Debswana, the world's leading diamond producer, showed that actually there was a middle ground, there was a better way. Debswana was the first company in the world to pr provide free antiretrovirals to his HIV positive staff. Debswana prioritized healthcare and education for their employees. They built schools and hospitals. Debswana realized that the success and the sustainability of their business depended on the health, happiness, and well being of its lowest ranking employees. Debswana realized that this was not a nice to have, but a business imperative. You see, we like things to be black and white. But life is not like that. The nature and the scale of our challenges in Africa requires leaders who are able to see the different shades of gray. Not the 50, a little bit more than that. <laughs> leaders who are able to wrestle and engage with the limits that they place on how we view the continent. Leaders who are able to seek out different perspectives, to empathize with different points of views. Leaders who are able to question their roles in this, collectively and individually. But too often, this binary thinking seems to be a matter of course, especially in the business world. I see it time and time again with South African firms as we look to expand north of our borders. We simply fail to get it. We adopt these my way or the highway attitudes to doing business in Africa. We go as executives into corporate boardrooms, and we speak in languages that our hosts won't understand. We proclaim how happy we are to be in Africa, as if it's some alien and exotic faraway place. The reality is that there's nothing exotic or alien about Africa. Yes, many countries on the continent are facing serious challenges, but are they really different to anything we're seeing anywhere else in the world? When I describe weak economies, regional tensions, falling currencies, and frequent terror attacks, you think Africa, when in fact I'm talking about Europe. You see, Africa hinges on a deeper and a more intimate kind of understanding. The nuances, the subtleties, and the intricacies. It's more than just the place that Simba and Mufasa get to hang out. <laughs> but to really see, feel, and experience Africa, and to play a part in the next phase 
of its growth and development, we need to embrace this ambiguity. We need to break out of our comfort zones. We need to think with different lenses. We need to go beyond the desktop analysis and beyond the simplistic CNN soundbites that we hear on a daily basis. Because there's more to Africa than the knee-jerk reaction to the day spot news that we hear. Now, tempting as it is, we need to resist the simplistic narratives around Africa and the direction that it's heading. We need to guard against Afro-optimism, Africa rising, and the hopeful continent. Just as in the past, it was wrong to dismiss Africa as a basket case and the hopeless continent. But this actually requires breaking the simple and narrow prisms we've used to define the continent's success or failure. But in reality, how can you even begin to understand the psyche of a country when you never leave the four walls of your hotel room? Without even the most rudimentary understanding of a country's history, how will you begin to understand the spirit of what shapes it, never mind its consumer preferences? Because I can tell you, I've learned more talking football and politics in the back of Ghanaian taxis, getting my beard done in Nigerian barbershops, and despite my two left feet on Angolan dance floors, than I have in many corporate boardrooms. But in reality, it's easier to say Africa's corrupt, it's hostile to foreigners, it's a difficult place to do business rather than to acknowledge that you didn't do your homework, that you didn't understand the market dynamics, you didn't understand the consumer preferences. But that's not a narrative that fits nicely and conveniently into the little boxes we've created to understand how Africa works and how the world works. And therein lies the problem. All too often, we're afraid of that missing middle. Because that actually requires us to think and to execute. So imagine I'd listened to CNN, who described Kenya as a hotbed of terror last year. If I listened to CNN, I would have reacted with fear and alarm. I would have outsourced my thinking. I would have been hysteric rather than rational. I wouldn't have traveled to Kenya. I would have lost the opportunity to meet with and engage with former Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo. I also would have missed a great selfie opportunity, but that's besides the point. We'll come back to that. <laughs> you see, in each and every story, there are multiple narratives at play. Like that day in 2012, when I walked back to the office to figure out what was happening in Ghana. I had a number of choices I could have made. Adrenaline was racing. Each and everywhere I turned, I was being bombarded blow by blow by news flashes and sound bites. Now, I could have pieced together my analysis from that, but the situation was more complex. It required more depth. It required more accuracy. And so, I needed to see the big picture. I needed to tap into the views of Ghana's politicians, its army generals, its youth, its economists, its intellectuals. Because otherwise, my analysis would have been shallow, simplistic, and crude. Ladies and gentlemen, the narratives we hear about Africa do not do the continent justice. They are preventing us from seeing the light from the shade. We need to embrace this missing middle. We need to embrace this ambiguity. We need to think beyond the binaries. We need to think in diverse and daring ways because this, my friends, is the currency of the future. And it's only by breaking down these limitations that we're going to be able to tell truly authentic and accurate stories about Africa rather than have them told to us. Asante sana. <laughs>